Let's go a long way back, Governor. When, when and where were you born? I was born in Atlanta in uh, on what we call Northside Drive today. It was Grove Street then, right there one block from the Atlanta Water Works. Grove Street used to be Grove. 41. That was that's Northside Drive today, right? Yes, sir. That was the main north-south thoroughfare? Yes, sir. No, so Hempdale Avenue really was the main one. Grove Street was sort of a parallel side street. Okay. But I was born on Grove Street in uh, September 30th, 1915. 19. So that's back when they didn't have any pavement on Hempdale Avenue or Lucky Street or 14th Street or 10th Hemphill Street. Hempdale was not paved in 1915. Oh, no, sir. Uh, I can remember back as a child when the, the old trolley cars would come down Hempdale Avenue uh, that goes by Georgia Tech now, into Georgia Tech. And the old cross ties out in the middle of the street. And remember the mud and the ditches and the rail on top of the cross ties. What are you, some of your earliest memories from your very earliest childhood about being around your house and the neighborhood and all? Well, it, uh, a lot of them. I guess one of the things that made the greatest impression on me was seeing little stores, groceries, hardware, mm -hmm. drug stores, general stores. All gone. Now. In, a, in a neighborhood, you know, and they're. They were about big as what we'd call somebody's big den or living room now. Mm -hmm. And they were all about the same size, but uh, the people were in business. And that was part of the private free enterprise system. Mm -hmm. And my earliest childhood memories are, are someday I wanted to be a business person. Yes, sir. And you I got it from seeing going in and out of these stores. And, and so with that. Goodness great. Well, now, your, your mom and dad, had they had they moved to, this is in Home Park, had they lived somewhere else before? How, how long had you been, had they been married? They married in 1912, and I was the second child. Second, how many brothers and sisters did you uh, have? Three brothers and three sisters originally. So you yes, the sir. second oldest one. Yes, sir. Right. That's kind of what about your dad, your mom? Where was your dad from? Where had he? He was from out of, in the DeKalb County area, his family. And uh, they were out there, uh, some of his people, in the Civil War. From DeKalb uh, from County. From DeKalb County. Like some of my mother's people, they were up in uh, Forsyth County, coming Georgia. That's where your mom came from? That's right. Her, her people, the Perkles. And her mother was a Perkle who married a Castleberry from up in coming Georgia, Forsyth County. Mm -hmm. And my dad's people were from generally around uh, Atlanta, which was back then was a rule, really, mm -hmm. even where Georgia Tech is, mm -hmm. was, was rule. How did your parents meet? Uh, I yeah. never... Being from different parts like that. They, their mother lived over in the same neighborhood around where we have Home Park School today. Mm -hmm. It's been converted to uh, apartments mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, they're uh, almost uh, one, well, two, one block from Georgia Tech campus. And uh, her mother, had lost her husband when my mother's uh, father died on a construction job at the uh, building the Carnegie Library in downtown Atlanta. They thought it was from a heat stroke, but we don't know for sure that maybe it could have been a heat stroke, could have been otherwise. Back then, of course, we didn't have air conditioning and people really worked for a living, but she lost her, her dad there and uh, her mother remarried and she uh, lived out near Home Park School, and my dad's people lived in the same general area. So when they married in 1912, well, they stayed in the same community. What kind of work did your dad do? He was a machinist. <clears throat> they call them roll turners. They turn the rolls that you fit together in the uh, equipment that's set up to run hot steel mm -hmm. bars through and shape it into whether it's cotton uh, ties or whether it's hoop steel or whether it's flat iron or whether it's angles or T-bars or channel irons or rods or whatever they might be. And he worked but, at Atlantic Steel? Yes, sir. Did he know that before he came there? Did he learn that working at the mill? Or? Uh, he, he started there. He was there when he was married. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He started there about, uh, I believe it was about 1905 or six. And he wasn't married until 1912. Did a lot of people in the neighborhood, I guess, work at Atlantic Steel? A lot of them did. Yes, sir. I worked at Atlantic Steel. You did? That was your... Yes. Now, I had thought that your first job was the same as my daddy's, selling newspapers on the 
selling Atlanta, Georgia. Well, that was one of my first jobs, and it may have been the first one, but uh, there was a lot of things I was involved in back then. I used to sell chickens that after I raised them, I'd hang five of them on a string and sell them in the neighborhood. In Home for, Park over there? Yes, sir. You could raise chickens in For there? 20 cents a chicken, you know, five of them for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> And I used to sell uh, Coca-Colas out in my front yard. Well, you know, they cost 80 cents a case. And uh, you got a nickel apiece for them, and you bought a dime's worth of ice. So you had a 90-cent investment. And if you didn't drink one of them, you could make 30 cents a day. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so I, I could... always want to be part of it. I used to try to sell my tomatoes and beans and things out of the yard there on 14th Street. And, but every time all mine got ready to market everybody else's did and they were hard to sell you know sometimes you had to leave them waste them or, or, or can them or, or give them away did you grow them yourself were you a pretty good gardener yes sir well uh, me uh, dad insisted that we do things like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we raised our own chicken cows hogs I bet they taste better right on 14th right. street right where georgia tech has a property now that they're developing their lang steel company how do they taste compared to that stuff you buy in the grocery store today well i i thought they uh the chickens back then that you well, grew up in the yard instead of confined like we do uh, inmates in a prison <laughs> i thought that the chicken had a, a much better taste uh it took a, they were a lot more uh, expensive i suppose you couldn't handle them today they'd cost five dollars a pound if we grew them like we did back then uh we didn't have all the means of developing them causing them to grow real fast but uh, they would run around the yard and they'd run the weight all fast as they would eat. So it'd take, it'd take uh, eight or nine weeks to get one up to two pounds. And now they get one to four pounds in six weeks. Dang God, that, that doesn't seem natural. <laughs> so you were selling food on early. You had an interest in selling things early. It was... Yes, sir. And so the, the newspaper part was just, you know, just part of it. I sold newspapers on the streets in downtown Atlanta back when they were costing two cents each and selling for three. And I had a, a lousy location. Where were you? Right, right across the street uh, from the Georgian newspaper, and they were get, practically giving them away over there. But that's the only stand I could get. Where and was the Georgian office? When the when the what? Atlanta Georgian, the, the newspaper. Well, I'd say uh, I don't know when it started, but it, it went up into the 30s before it finally. Well, I, where were they physically located? Right where the Atlanta Journal Constitution is now. Right straight across from the old Constitution building. Or old Georgia Power Company building. Okay, I know where they did. Yeah. Well, you went to Home Park Elementary School there, I, I guess. Did you, you have any recollection of that? Any teachers that influenced you or had an effect on you at Home Park? Do you have any? Yes, sir. The things I remember most about Home Park, I think we had. Even though a lot of us misbehaved, you know, in school, people always have misbehaved, whether they were children or adults, yes. you know. And it's, 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 misbehavior is no respect of per persons. I mean, it it goes on as long as you're able to get, get something done. Some of it's going to be wrong. I was a teacher but, for 12 years. I've seen uh, a lot of it. <laughs> but I, I think the uh, methods of discipline and so forth were so much better and stronger. Did they and there was so much more respect for the teacher. Did they use uh, corporal it, punishment? Could they? Would they spank? Oh yes, sir. They were allowed to do that. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. I never did get one of those, but a lot of them in my room did. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes right there in the room. Sometimes usually we out in the hallway or, or to the principal's office. But I I really believe that uh, if we had that same type of uh, uh, discipline today that we had then, we'd have better better educated children and better behaved adults. Okay, that was, I guess, World War One was going on from, well, no, it was, that was over when I started by, school. By then. Did you have any, remember any particular heroes or villains from your early, like, elementary school, people you really looked up to or thought a lot of? Or? Well, you know, our history books back then told us about uh, Patrick Henry and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Nathan Hale and and so forth so they were all heroes we we looked up to them we looked up to the country and we had praise and admiration for those people and for our country too i think much more so it was a more patriotic time during the 20s you reckon? oh yes sir absolutely 
Yes, so that's back when we well, had a great deal of respect for law enforcement officers, judges, ministers, mm -hmm. uh, public officials. What about President Wilson or Harding, the ones after that? Was any particular feelings about them around the neighborhood that they were good guys or bad guys? Or Not to my knowledge. They may have been with other students, mm -hmm. other young people, mm -hmm. but I don't recall any impressions that had been made on me because of even Woodrow was, much less some of them that followed, because I was very uh, well informed when Roosevelt campaigned. And when he was elected, I remember I was going to attend in high, O'Keefe High School at that time. And he came and spent the night over at the old Biltmore Hotel, and the next day had a rally. He came through the schoolyard and uh, had a rally over at Georgia Tech. Did people feel good about him in your neighborhood during that time? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Let's see, this is the early Depression. You were, in 1930, you were 15, 19, when the Depression began. Do you remember that, the onset of the Depression? Oh, yes, sir. I remember, remember the stock market crash. Were you selling yes, papers? <laughs> uh, well, I was selling papers before then. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. I just wonder about I, that day. The stock I was market. selling papers. I used to uh, even walk from, before I was 15 years old, I would walk from 14th Street. Uh, when you could ride a Jitney or a Georgia Power Company uh, streetcar to downtown for a nickel, but we it's would a Jitney. Well, there's a Model T Ford or some old automobile that you could ride to Atlanta for a nickel, and uh, they were in competition with the Georgia Power Company's trolley cars, electric trolley cars. So you were in. You could ride either one for a nickel or and go to Atlanta and ride back for another nickel. But we never did use them, sell them ever, because we didn't have the nickel. And so I would, uh, oftentimes I would, at least once a week, I would walk from around Atlanta Waterworks, Atlantic Steel Company, walk to downtown Atlanta, uh, where they had uh, built the viaducts over what, the railroads, and that turned into, that was originally downtown Atlanta. And when they built the viaducts in the early 20s, it converted into the what we call the underground Atlanta today. Yes. <clears throat> and it went from a regular retail to a farmer's market, produce market, underground Atlanta. And I used to walk down there and <clears throat> buy a 10-pound <clears throat> bag of peanuts for half a dollar. And it was five cents a pound. And I would walk back out of Atlanta and build a fire in Mother's stove and parched my peanuts, and if I didn't burn them, I'd bag them, and the next day I'd walk back to Atlanta again and sell them. And uh, it didn't take but two trips to Atlanta and back, and a half a dollar, and the cost of the paper bags, which was almost nothing. How long did it take you to walk down there? Well, you know, it's a, it was about two and a quarter, two and a half miles. So a round trip would give you about four and a half to five. Pretty good miles. Pull. Pretty good. It it it'd take you about a, you know an hour, hour, fifteen minutes <clears throat> round trip. But I could take those peanuts and uh, parse them after I built the fire and bag them. Then I make another trip to Atlanta and I'd sell them for a dollar and a half, and that didn't have for half a dollar in them. It didn't take but two days to get it all together. Was there, when the Depression hit in 1929, was there any big change like in your life or in Home Park or did it affect Atlantic Steel or the neighborhood? Did it? Uh, yes, sir, we were in our particular family and Daddy lost his job. And we had, uh, prior to the crash of uh, stock market crash, we had sold our property on 14th Street, the land and the home for $2,500. And Daddy had found out later who was buying and he hadn't been told and he, he welched on the deal and made them give him $5,000 <laughs> instead of $2,500 for our home and our land too. And got 5000 out of it and, and also got them to agree to give us the house. And so we moved that house that Daddy personally constructed back in it when we first constructed it didn't even have a bathroom in it <laughs> and uh, we moved it and uh, after we sold out the Firestone and uh, I know it was it was Silvertown whoever Silvertown is Tires. I think it's Goodrich yeah 
believe it was Goodrich Silvertown. And we uh, spent one night in State Street, a house and all, when we were moving that place. And How did they move the house? And we were, we were living generally, uh, got to living generally out of what, almost off of what we were having to eat out of the yard. During the and depression, so forth. what you could raise. And mother and daddy had to start taking in laundry. Daddy would go out and knock on people's doors and pick up their laundry mm -hmm. and take it home. He and mother would wash it and iron it and deliver it. And, uh, it was pretty rough for everybody during that time. Yes, sir. Well, you know, it didn't really bother us a, a lot. I, we, I had to quit school. So my daddy had to quit in the ninth grade. Yeah, yeah, where, you know, you didn't mind it, you know, I had to put cardboard in the bottom of your shoes to get back and forth from Tech High or O'Keefe. But it finally got where, you know, you did, the holes got so big in your shoes, even though you could get new ones at Cressus for 15 mm -hmm. cents, <laughs> you didn't have the 15 cents. Well, <laughs> but I, it, never, it never did bother us. I think it really taught us something. I remember one, one Christmas, me and my brother went to Salvation Army's Christmas party. So we could have Christmas, <laughs> but that never did bother us because you know you're part of the United States of America. You didn't think that was part as, of life. You didn't think yourself as poor. Or... No, I didn't find that out until you know the Roosevelt went in office. Uh, no, Lyndon Johnson started talking. <laughs> <laughs> started talking about poverty. I found out I'd been living in it for a long time. Didn't know it. Well. Um... There were black kids in that neighborhood, weren't they? Did, weren't oh, they, they were. Uh, their property adjoined ours on, on, when we lived on State Street. Yes, sir. I grew up near Piedmont Park, and it were like there were black families like in the alleys and small houses behind that area over there near Ponce Leon Ballpark. Right. But I don't know Home Park. Was it pretty much the same thing? Black families scattered pretty much throughout the neighborhood? Well, not scattered so much. They were generally in our immediate neighborhood across less than a block from the school. They were in the next block from the school. Mm -hmm. We faced the school and their property was behind us on what they called Crawford Place and then there was Tumlin Street. But over around, not far around, close to Marietta Street in uh, Six and Macmillan. Mm -hmm. And in those areas, there were uh, quite a number of them. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot, a uh, number of black people lived down off of 14th Street. Mm -hmm. On, I, I can't even think of the name of the street at this time. So there wasn't any you associated with and played with black kids when you were growing up, I assume, and had friends and played baseball with, that type of thing? Well, I didn't play a lot of ball. I was a little bit on the thin side and, and the small side, and, and I was badly nearsighted. <laughs> so it was back like when I used to, used to caddy for the golf people, you know. I, I had to follow the golfer instead of the ball. <laughs> Finally got where they wouldn't any of them hire me. You know? <laughs> but uh, we, uh, they had separate schools, well, not separate neighborhoods, because uh, our property adjoined the black community. We lived on State Street and they lived on Crawford. They, they backed up to each other. You were no stranger to black people. No, sir. What about your parents' uh, political beliefs or, and or religious beliefs? How did they influence you? Well, my dad had a problem. He was a good dad and he provided the best that he could. And he was not only worked for Lang Steel Company, but he traded cows or automobiles, anything he could. To kind of rural urban combination. Build, build his house and then sell it and, uh -huh. and those things. And so he made some extra money that way and he impressed me because of his hard work and, and uh, his, his dedication to providing the best of his ability. And then my, my impression from my mother, she had a, a, quite a bit of illness when I was 11, 12 years old. I had to drop out of school for a while to actually do the cooking at home mm -hmm. for my sisters and brothers at the time. Wasn't she a right religious but, lady? But my mother, she is still living, and that's what impressed me most. She uh, carried us to Sunday school and the church, and she taught uh, Sunday school for over 50 years. And she's lost, uh, today uh, her thinking gets mixed up. Of course, a lot of people do that don't have no problem. And But she remembers her children, and there's uh, 
the hymns from the church and the Bible verses that she taught, she can, that's something that God has given her ability to keep within her just as well, you're known. real as anything. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. So you're known for your strong real that we can miss a, We can miss a, a, a few words on a hymn and she can pick it up. So your strong religious faith, you think, was she influenced you that way? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. In fact, I've been going to North Atlanta Church since 1917 or 18. And the uh, teacher that taught me in the beginner's class in 1918 is still alive. Mm -hmm. And she's still a member of our church. <laughs> so that's influenced you throughout your life, has it? Yes, sir. I didn't know. You know, I, I, I've been around long enough and studied history enough and studied people enough to to know that the only sure thing I know positively that I can count on is my faith in God and my belief in uh, His effect in my life and what it has meant to, to people who trust Him and follow Him and what it has meant to the development of the United States of America and its survival to this point. What about politics? What did they think about or FDR and the New Deal. How did did you was that filtered through their political ideas? Your opinion about it, or did they know or? See, back then you didn't have radio and you didn't have TV. See, we didn't have radio until 1922, and then we only had the earphones when WSB uh, opened up over the old Biltmore Hotel. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of children in our family, our mother and dad, and so we had problems getting to hear it. radio. So we didn't know much about politics unless you read it in the fish wrapper, <laughs> whatever you got there. So you didn't have no TV, and no radio, and I know people had real strong feelings about President Roosevelt. My grandmother thought he took his orders directly from the Kremlin. So. <laughs> well, I I don't know. He he really came along at a, at a time that was important, I think, to the nation. Uh, somebody else got blamed with all the problems, and I think the next four years somebody's going to get blamed. With somebody else's problems uh, but Roosevelt did uh, get a majority of the people to believe that he was doing what was best to bring us out of a tragic economic situation right. and whether we would have come out any other way at that time I don't know we really didn't get out of it then until World War two came along World War II really ended the Depression. Right? Yes. And the New Deal, I thought, for a bit. I understand that you, at one time, briefly worked on a WPA job and formed bad opinions about it from that. Is there any truth to that? that you? Well, you know, I used to work at 6th Street Drug Store after I had left Jules Supply Company, Jules Wholesale Supply in the Flatiron Building downtown Atlanta, and that job was paying four dollars a week. And it was six days a week. And I went from there to making a, a dentures. And I was taught how to make dentures by a, a young black man with the uh, Chandler Dental Lab. And uh, when I left there, and it was about 19 early 33 I went to 6th Street Pharmacy and it was still four dollars a week and the man got shot by some hold up people at the drugstore and he, he finally recovered from it but he suffered so in his business that one week I was acting as soda jerker and delivery man and everything else in the drugstore for four dollars a week and it was uh, 84 hours a week and it got so bad one week he couldn't uh, couldn't pay me so he gave me the bicycle and I finally got me a job at Lang Steel Company Roosevelt had just gone in office and raised the hour rate from uh, 15 cents an hour to 25 cents an hour instead of 60 hours at nine dollars a week it started being ten dollars for 40 hours a week and immediately after that, he set up the uh, WPA, which was 30 cents an hour, uh, 40 hours a week. 
which was would have been a 20% salary increase for me. So I quit my job at Lang Steel Company at $10 a week and 40 hours a week to go with a WPA for $12 a week because it was so important. Back then I was I was <coughs> giving my mother $5 a week and I was putting $4 a week in the bank and I was using the other $1 for my spending money. And uh, every, every Friday I bought me a Coca-Cola when the soft drink truck and sandwich van came around. And that was back when you would uh, buy your shirts for 59 cents each at Chris's and your trousers for 69 cents. And, and my first suit I bought, one of the Sewell suits from down on Whitehall Street, it was $12 and a half. And, uh, so, what, what kind of work did you do for the WPA? What was it? So the, it was ditch digging. That's practically what everything. They didn't have tractors and they, they didn't have heavy equipment. In the city. People got out with wheelbarrows and uh, picks and shovels and they would build buildings or they would uh, excavate for building the street, do the grading. And the, my part was <clears throat> was helping to, a few days that I was there, was helping to uh, move dirt where they were building, uh, I believe, Techwood Drive extension between 10th and 4th Street or somewhere in there. Was Techwood Homes <laughs> built then or was that being built? Uh, across from Georgia Tech Stadium, like the, I remember President Roosevelt came to town to dedicate Techwood Homes. I just wondered if that was a WPA project or y'all worked on that. No, sir, I didn't work on that. I don't believe that was a WPA project. It could have been. I don't think it, I don't was, think it was. But anyhow, uh, about the first four days, it rained two days and I didn't get to work. And if I had been at Lang Steel Company, I would have been working. And y'all didn't get paid if you didn't work. That's right. So I quit WPA and went back down there and begged the, the superintendent to give me my job back at Lang Steel Company, and he did. And that took <laughs> you. Okay, so that's 30. Well, in 1936 was the year you uh, married Virginia, is that correct? That's correct. Where, where did you meet her? And tell me a little bit about y'all. First time I recall seeing Virginia was up at a on Macmillan Street at Lynch Avenue. It, uh, a lady had in her front of her home there, she had a little sandwich shop, an ice cream stand. Mm -hmm. Now, if I, I, I don't ever remember seeing it anywhere before then, I could have and didn't, don't recall. But she was on a bicycle, she was a bicycle rider. And as well as I remember, she had an Eskimo pie. And uh, I happened to be walk, walking down the sidewalk and saw her for the first time on the bicycle and I just made up my mind. That's, that's who I wanted. <laughs> She's a pretty thing. She's still pretty. I bet she was pretty when she was young too. Right? Yes, sir. Uh, stole your heart right away. Yes, sir. You know, I just, you know, you, some things you, you make up your mind about. This is what I want. Like I always wanted to be successful in business. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I, 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 a lot of people think some Democrats, some Republicans, and the political parties think that they're the ones that made the country great. But I don't look at it like that way. See, I, I say any good businessman could make a good governor, a good president, you know, some good businessman has had to grow from the ground up and develop and so forth, but he's been his own secretary, his own treasurer, his own administrative assistant, he's been his uh, chief executive officer mm -hmm. and so forth. He, and they could make a good president, a good governor, a good congressman and so forth, but a lot of good congressmen, presidents, governors could never make a good businessman. <laughs> and so I always wanted to be a good businessman, and I set that as a goal, and I set my goal to, to woo and win her. How long did Joe and I, That's You know, that's one of my earliest members of real sincere prayer. Just praying <laughs> that she'd marry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't know anybody ever prayed for, for their wife to be or not, but I know I did. And then your prayers were answered. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, uh, what about your early years of y'all's marriage? I understand you were in the, in Birmingham at the outbreak of the war. How did you happen to end up over there working for the Navy? Well, see, I went to and went back to Lang Steel Company, and I developed into a supervisor position. Yes. And uh, the CIO or AFL, I believe it was CIO, came along and tried to organize it like steel company and they finally succeeded in doing so. And that's... What did you think about that? Well, I thought something was needed and that wasn't proper 
for management. Because I can remember back, not only Lang Steel, but in industry in general, that employees were just like a piece of equipment. If one got injured on the job or laid out too often, or, well, he lost his job oftentimes. And there was no uh, provision for, for providing for people that were hurt that way. Workman's compensation or, or unemployment insurance and so forth. And uh, we were oftentimes in some of these industrial jobs afraid to go to the restroom very often or go to get a drink of water too often. And if you were off on the job for one day, you had sometimes feel like you had to have a, a doctor, a letter from the doctor that you were really ill. And so uh, we were really captives. And I seen it go one extreme to the other, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But something was needed and I wasn't going either in di either direction because I was part of management in supervisor position in charge of one of the plants, the galvanizing plant there. But someone had advised the superintendent that two of my men had been seen, two black men had been seen uh, riding around with union organizers. And uh, my superintendent called me up and advised me and informed me that what they had found out and they wanted me to fire these two uh, black men immediately. And uh, I told him, I said, I can't do that. He said, well, you have to. I, he, I said, what, what excuse do I have? He says, just tell them that uh, they're no good. I said, well, I don't have any better men than they are. They're two of the best men I have. <laughs> he said, well, just tell them that you're reducing force. I said, well, I can't do that. I said, that wouldn't be telling the truth because I've just put on the third shift. You know, we've gone from one shift to two shifts to three shifts because of the business. And I said, I'm not reducing force. And he said, well, uh, as long as you work in Lang Steel Company, you're going to care what management directs you to do. Or you're not going to work anymore. Well, I was only making $29 a week at that time. And I had a wife and two babies at home. And I told him, I said, well, I, I guess, you know, if, if I've got to do like you say, then I don't work anymore. I said, I, I like my job and I got to provide for my family. But uh, the minute I've got to lie to keep my job, I said, I've lost it. And so that's why I wound up in <laughs> it was a tough thing for you. In Alabama. <laughs> yeah, I went back there five years later, and those two blacks were still working there. In fact, that day on the phone, when I refused to fire them, I said, the moment I got to start lying to keep my job, that's when I don't work anymore. And he said, well, send them up to see me. And he was afraid to fire them. The company was. He wanted you to do his dirty work for him, didn't he? <laughs> and uh, he was afraid to fire them. And, and five years later, I went back and those two same men that I had to fire that day were still had a good job. <laughs> good, good employees are hard to fire. Is what they mean. That's why I was in Bessemer, Alabama when I went over there. Because they had steel mill where you could do similar type of work? No, it was Nashville Bridge Company. And the subsidiary, it was Bessemer Galvanizing Works. And I had been running the galvanizing plant in Atlantic Steel Company. Okay. The strip mill and uh, the miscellaneous and the bar mill, both galvanizing operations. And uh, so I went over there and we were getting started in, in the, we hadn't declared war, but we were already, you know, Hitler had already started his part of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> they were galvanizing for the Navy and had a pretty big operation, but they were not familiar with really how to galvanize. They'd just grown into it like during the war. <clears throat> we took people that were building Coca-Cola trucks and, and the farm equipment and started building airplanes with <clears throat> the same people and, the, and ships and so forth. And so I got the job over there, but that job, and I had to move my family over there. And like them that, never got the people's bank to permit me to move my furniture because I had a loan on it. 
<laughs> and uh, uh, I had to move my wife and, and, and two daughters over there, and they didn't pay but 85 cents an hour. We had to change state, not only cities and jobs, but change states because of it. And so I was there at uh, uh, Nashville Bridge Company when World War II started, when uh, the part of it that involved us when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, uh, 1941. What do you remember your feelings about that day and when that happened? Well, yeah, it was on Sunday. And, uh, it just shut us down as far as in our house. We stayed glued to the radio. Mm -hmm. We didn't have TV. I don't think anybody had TV then. And it may have not surprised Washington, but it surprised the rest of the people in the country. And it shocked us. And that was the first such attack this nation had ever experienced, other than the Revolutionary War. And that was a lot of difference. It came by ship then. <laughs> was there? <laughs> and if it had been by ship this in Pearl Harbor instead of by plane, it would have been a different story for us. Was there fear of an invasion? Were people panicky about that time? I don't think they were panicky. I think they were shocked and surprised that somebody would attack the United States of America in such a fashion. And they must have recognized from the beginning that we were threatened, our survival was threatened, and they were willing, or as I know, or as I could determine, everybody was willing to come to the defense of their country, whatever it would, would take. So different from today. It was the last time there was that kind of unity, I guess, wasn't it, in the whole country? It was a week after that that I was hit with a piece of steel from a gondola. I was on a gondola call, checking out a lot of ship plates or Pascagoula, Mississippi, or Mobile, Alabama, or, or Charleston. We were handling work for a lot of the shipbuilders. Mm -hmm. And uh, a horse from the crane, the lift on the crane, slipped out from a load of ship plates, about five tons of them, and I saw it slip, and everybody in the railroad car did, gondola-type car. So I turned immediately, and that steel hook hit me in the back, picked me up out of that car, and splattered me all over the concrete. <laughs> Oh, were you hurt bad? So I, and that wasn't the Japanese after me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was crippled. I was in the hospital quite a while. How were you hurt? And, Legs, head? Or well, back? mainly that, that wrist. See, it goes forward all right, uh -huh. but it won't go backwards. It won't go sideways. I'll be so, dead gone. See, all messed up in that. So I, that was, uh, I think for that injury and that stay in the hospital, my wife over in a strange town with two babies. The insurance company finally paid us $750, but they wanted to give it back later on. They wanted us to pay it back. And they wanted me to go back to the hospital and they were going to break my arm again and put it put it back in a cast like that instead of a cast like this. Yes. Sir. Cast like that so later on maybe I could get it to come. If, if it were back there to start with, if they could set it up like this mm -hmm. instead of like this, then when they did take it out, maybe I could go back and forth with it. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, you know, they wanted their seven hundred fifty dollars back, <laughs> and I didn't want to go through all that pain. So I've suffered with it ever since. That I've had, to, you know, I, you have your cold weather and so forth. And well, now by nineteen forty. In fact, in fact, that you know that hand's not as big as this one. Yes, sir. I can see it. I can see you have less movement there. Well, that was part of uh, losing my job at Lang Steel Company. Well, man, by 1944, you were back in Atlanta with opening your first restaurant, I understand, one that preceded Pickrick. How did you get back here and start that restaurant? What well, I, I, while I was in Birmingham, in Bessemer, Alabama, I moved from Bessemer up to Birmingham. I got me a job with the U.S. Navy Department as an inspector of engineering materials. And uh, I worked uh, in and around Birmingham for them in the, at night. And I continued my job at Nashville Bridge Company uh, daytime. Yes, sir. So I were, had two jobs, a day and night job. <laughs> <laughs> and I, finally the Navy wanted me to go somewhere else, and I agreed to come to Atlanta. And I would leave 
the U.S. Navy Department as far as Birmingham was concerned, and I would quit my job with Nashville Bridge Company uh, on the condition I said, I'll do that. You know, it, it was hard to find anybody who knew anything about building ships or airplanes. <laughs> Back then, it's amazing what we were able to accomplish, you know, at Bell Aircraft. It's uh, miraculous uh, in Marietta. But, uh, I agreed to come to Atlanta with the U.S. Navy Department, subject to uh, their agreement, the misunderstanding on that part later, that I would stay in Atlanta and not travel. And I wasn't over here long in Atlanta after I left the U.S. Navy Department in Birmingham and the uh, Nashville Bridge Company investment <clears throat> until I was spending weeks away from Atlanta and away from my wife and children in uh, Goldsboro, South Carolina, Greenville, Rock. What were you doing for the Navy Department? Inspecting their plants to see if they were doing things right? Or? Well, see, it's contracted out. It wasn't Navy plants. It was individual. Maybe some family had been building truck bodies. They were building ship materials, mm -hmm. uh, bulkheads and ship plates and, and various things that go to one well, of the minesweepers to destroy your escorts. All those things we were involved with. And uh, the workers in those plants had never done any of this type of work. So we had to change the whole manufacturing process in this country to be successful in World War II. If we had not been able to do it, we'd probably lost the war. And as our industrial might, industrial capacity, and the ability to, uh, to retrain our people to develop war materials and defense materials and offense materials, whatever you want to call them, uh, and ships and planes that made it possible for us to win that war. Otherwise, if we'd been as far back as some of the other countries, we probably wouldn't be the United States of America today as a free republic. And so we went into those places and they'd taken people who used to fry hamburgers and cook chicken and sell insurance and, and um, soda jerk and uh, laundry drivers and whoever they were and made skilled workmen out of them in these plants. But it, it wasn't all that easy to start with. Uh, I had gone into some plants where we had to make the unload two freight car loads up in uh, Rock Hill, South Carolina one day because they had welded them wrong and the wells would, they had put the wells together as a, as a butt well and then ground off the top of it because they had seen a line drawn on the blueprint and they didn't know what that meant. So they thought after they welded them two sheets together and they, they had the, uh, the well hanging up on top, that that had to come back down flush with the metal again. Like this weak in the well. Then. So I had to, had to, had, in one day in particular, I had to have them unload two cars. And, and But it, it was the fact that we didn't have trained people. And, uh, and I think in normal times, I would not have even had the job as a inspector of engineering materials, even though I had studied some engineering and accounting in addition to my school in public schools in Atlanta. I'd had a correspondence course and I'd had the experience in, in heavy industry and so forth as so that put me in a better position than a lot of engineers right. that you practically had an engineering degree. Right. And uh, so uh, I found out, you know, that right the opposite of what they had agreed upon that I would stay in Atlanta. The traveling is what led you to come back to Atlanta and start yeah, your own I business. Yeah, I was going all over the country, staying away. I and mean, how old were your children then? That's the reason I opened, oh, I left there and went with Bell Aircraft. Th that was uh, what we call Lockheed today? Was, yes, sir. Was it out in Marietta? Yes, sir. Uh, so it hadn't opened at that time. Uh, they had got, gotten a contract, and so everyone they employed from around Georgia in this part of the country went to a lot of them. Uh, went to Buffalo for training, and so I went to Buffalo, New York, with Bell Aircraft. Well, when you left the Navy, did you knew <clears throat> you knew you could stay in Atlanta if you worked with Bell? Was was that the primary reason for that switch? Primary, yes, sir. And it was war work too, just like the Navy right. thing was, it was in war. your same field, right? I had a, I had a I think a, a real important job with the Navy Department. Sounds like it. So and, uh, Bell sent you to Buffalo to train? Uh, yes, sir, along with a lot of other people that they employed. 
because the ones they sent to Buffalo that later were the ones that were going to come back and help be the nucleus of training mm -hmm. and supervision and the development of the plan. Mm -hmm. And that job, I think, I believe it just started at $1.15 an hour. The <laughs> first time I went to a, went to Buffalo with Bell Aircraft, I was there six weeks in the middle of winter. Ooh. And I never did see the ground during that six weeks. I had to go back later to see if it even had any. <laughs> <laughs> it snowed the whole time. I like to kill me being away from my wife and baby six weeks. Well, I bet it did. Cold. <laughs> Georgia boy, we weren't used to that cold. Oh, goodness. So how did you get from Bell Aircraft to the restaurant business? Well, I started off with Bell Aircraft in their training program and we helped get out the first 15 planes. Some of the parts we had to go downstairs and teach people how to make them that were supposed to be furnished for either by the government or purchased. We made B-24s, B-17s? It wasn't it B-29 or B-19? B I believe it was B-29. B-29 was the one that Doolittle bombed Japan with, I know, but I think they came out relatively late in the war. B-29, I believe. That's right. That's probably what y'all know. Gee, I'm, I regret that I've forgotten which one it was. But anyhow, we we couldn't get the parts either furnished by government in some instances, in some places, or maybe, maybe on the wing or the fuselage, or uh, could not get them as supposed to have been purchased. The manufacturer hadn't been able to deliver them. So occasionally we went downstairs in the shop and helped to actually hand make, <laughs> custom make some parts to get those first 15 planes out. And we had to help teach people that used to be, you know, plowing mules and uh, soda jerking and cooking hamburgers and selling insurance of those things. And I helped to teach a half craft blueprint reading, reading, even though I never had a, had a course in it in school myself. <laughs> but, uh, we got the first 15 planes out on those stressful conditions. And I didn't, they, it got disgusting me. I didn't have enough to keep me busy. And some days that you go to lunch at 12 o'clock, you'd see people down there eating at 11.30 and they'd still be eating down there at 1 o'clock or, or in the tunnels next to a piano singing some gospel songs or country songs. and. And we're supposed to get off like maybe uh, 4.42 in the afternoon. You go down the, in the <clears throat> tunnels at, at 4.15 and there'd be a thousand people waiting for to get to 4.42 so they could ring out. And I kept complaining to some of the top supervisor personnel about not having anything to do. And I tried to get a job in the energy engineering and planning. I was in uh, schedules and changes, you know, we'd schedule the parts be ordered or be manufactured or be uh, supplied by the government and, and we schedule them to the assembly line and, uh, and the changes that would come in, the deviations on the uh, prints and plans and so forth and they were coming by the thousands, you know, different parts, different things about the plan. And uh, they moved me from there to dispatch and I saw that we were going to shut the plant down if we didn't get certain parts. I went to the supervisor, the top supervisor about it, and they said, oh, we're going to be all right. First thing you know, uh, the, we didn't have the parts and we couldn't produce the wings. And with wings, if you didn't have the wings, it was the fuselage was no good completed. And I told him, I said, we're going to shut this plant down if we, if we don't get them in. And this uh, fellow was one of the original Bell people out in Buffalo. Oh, we're going to be all right, he said. And the uh, first thing you know, we shut the plant down. They didn't want to blame me with it. <laughs> Did? <laughs> yeah, I and I got, I, I told him straight out, I said, you know, I came to you six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, I was told if we didn't do this, we were going to have this problem. And so they couldn't pin that on me. But then I, my biggest problem at Bell was seeing thousands of people, nothing to do. And the more it, a defense industry spends, the more the taxpayers pay. And they had us working on jobs where there were no jobs. Mm -hmm. We were on the payroll. And they had called you in on, they had already in on Saturday, nothing to do. Then on Sunday, I, I believe it was time and a half on Sunday. 
still nothing to do. Still nothing to do. And I got so disgusted, even though I was, you know, didn't have any income, and I had a life savings that time, four hundred dollars. That I went home one Friday and mailed my badge in. I didn't even go back up there to turn it in. You had to have a badge to get admitted to the plant. Was there any union activity up there? Were they anybody no, tending to organize them at that time? No, sir. But it was uh, that's the way our government operates a lot, though. Apparently, yeah. a lot of that's still going on. <laughs> oh yes, sir. It goes on and on and on. But uh, I guess there's more corruption outside of government than in government, you know, in our private sector, business, industry, so forth. Because I see it, I've witnessed it, and I know, you know, I've been around a lot of people, a lot of places, big shots, little shots, and half shots, and <laughs> a lot of little shots that think they're big shots. So I, I, I do have that background, that knowledge, that experience in it. And so uh, I left Barrel Aircraft. And Did you have any idea was what a, you were going to do that was you a, left? That was a practice at the end of the World War II. I believe Germany had already surrendered at that time, and we were still in war with Japan. This was May of 45. Did you know what you were going to do, or did you just know you weren't going to do that anymore? No, I, I, I thought I'd, I didn't know for sure what I was going to do, but shortly after that, I took an old building that used to be a building I used to raise pigeons in when I was a kid. Daddy bought it from $25 out at Piedmont Park and brought it home. It was a 12 by 12, pretty good sized building. It was uh, something to do with the golfing or park range or something out there. And uh, I had earlier, before I went to Atlantic Steel Company, I had uh, run my pigeons out and got rid of them, washed out all the manure and everything. And, started selling Coke Colas and candy in that same building. And when I left Bell Aircraft, I went up on 14th Street at State Street. Right across from what they call it, the little cool corner grocery now. And, and the Atlantic Steel, uh, United Steel Workers Union hauler, catty corner from it. And I took that $400 and went in that building and uh, started selling hamburgers, me and Virginia did. <laughs> Cooking them there yourself? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, hot dogs, that's back when you, you know, we didn't even have a restroom in the place and uh, didn't have any hot water. Was it in walking distance of Tech and the steel mill? Is that where your yes, customers sir. came that's from? Yes, right them? on the corner. Uh -huh. the same building I'd raised the pigeons in earlier and uh, ran, ran the pigeons out and started selling uh, penny candy and new grape cocoa. <laughs> new grape, God. And, so we sold hot dogs back then for five cents, you know, you the frankfurter and the bread and the onions and mustard and ketchup and chili for a nickel, and you still make a penny off of it. And uh, the draft board accused me, just before the war ended, put in a war job. And they called me in to select the service board. And I uh, wonder why I quit a war job. I said I didn't quit a war job. I didn't have a job. Well, he says, do you quit a war plant? I said, yes, but I said I didn't have a job. And I met before the whole draft board. And uh, they said, well, they're going to have to replace you. I said, not unless they just got to have another name on the payroll, because I didn't have a job, and I begged them for months and months to give me something to do. And, uh, and back then, Virginia's health was pretty bad, which she had a bad infection after a childbirth and hadn't gotten over it. And, uh, they excused me on a deferment. Even though they accused me of quitting a war job, I told them I didn't have a war job, but they didn't have to, didn't have to replace me unless they just wanted to have payroll. And I explained to them how they wanted me to work on Sunday, report in but not work, and so forth. And, uh, the whole idea of stealing from the taxpayers didn't appeal to you? Oh, man, I lied. It was disgusting. You know, if you, if you don't have a job and you don't have any money, you don't own your home, you don't even own an automobile, see? Uh -huh. And you quit a job, you've got to be dissatisfied. Because you know you're, you're jeopardizing maybe your, your baby's getting something to eat. But it, it just, it still bothers me to see so much waste. Oh. And it's gotten down in the business now just as bad as it is in government, it looks like to me.
almost as bad. So that graduated into the pickrick? Yes, I had already opened it. At the time, it, I, uh, the draft board called me in, and I was there in that building serving hot dogs and ice cream and hamburgers and a sewing machine thread and potato chips and work gloves. And did you do pretty good? First aid hits. Did you make a living during that? Oh, yes, I did real well. Did real well. Now, I've got a 1947 day for starting the, the pickerel. Did you make enough out of this first uh, hot dog stand to, to start the pickerel with that? Was that how it worked? Well, what I what I did was uh, I sold that Lester's Grill, what we called it, Lester's State Grill. 14th Street. Lester's Grill. I sold it one year from the day I opened it up. And I started with four hundred dollars, and I sold it for forty-five hundred. <laughs> and uh, we had bought our first automobile, which was a thirty-seven Dodge two-door car, and we'd had an automobile wreck. And I like to lost my family. In fact, my son just left here this morning. It was thrown through the windshield, and uh, another son that still carries injuries. From an automobile accident. And uh, after that happened, one month after I had sold that restaurant for four to five hundred dollars, a man and his wife who had bought it were having so much uh, domestic matrimonial problems mm. that they sold it back to me for thirty five hundred. <laughs> and they didn't have it but a month. But it was uh, breaking up their family. Mm. And so I bought it back for thirty-five hundred and sold it the next day again for forty-five hundred. You sold it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went from there to the grocery business uh, at Hampton and Eighth Street near Georgia Tech. And I bought a grocery store, and I didn't take it over the day I bought it on Saturday because. The following day was Sunday, and I was going to go there Monday to start operating my grocery store. So when I got in Monday morning, a lot of my groceries had been moved. And some of the neighbors came in around the grocery store and said, We thought you were moving out yesterday because they moved so much out of the store. Well, the people that I had bought it from had moved a lot of my merchandise. And I went to Lee Evans, and it was a, he was a city alderman here, an attorney, and a very prominent family. And uh, went in, in his office, and I refused to, to complete the deal transaction on the store after they'd moved all my merchandise. And I found out too that the sugar stamps required in World War II, and and uh, after World War II, followed some some period after that, and the meat stamps and so forth. That all that they had claimed the store had when we called the stores, the suppliers, we found out they didn't have any of them. That the Merchants had, uh, had lied about what they had available that I was getting, so I didn't have any means to get meat and uh, sugar and some of the other things that were rationed during World War II. So we went into their office. They wanted to know why, you know, why I wasn't going to complete the deal, and I told them because they'd stole so much of my merchandise. And uh, Mr. Evans, he was city alderman at the time. He said, "Well, Mr. Myers, say you're a businessman. He says if you'd." Uh, you sold your place, uh, and you had a few items in there you wanted to get out, and you had an opportunity to do it. Well, wouldn't you do it? I said, no, sir. I said, if you feel like that's the way it ought to be done, I said, Mr. Evans, I said, then you the same kind of crook these three people are. They were all in his office. <laughs> and I said, I, 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 I said, you the same kind of so-and-so crook they are. And I said, I, I'm not going to fool with you. And I got up and slammed my chair against the desk and slammed the door and told him I was gone. I said, I'm going to get me somebody just as crooked as you are. <laughs> I, I said, I don't know how to handle this thing, but I'm going to get me a lawyer just as crooked as you are, and then I'll get it straightened out. Well, that afternoon they called up. I told them, I told them earlier, I said, if you want to give me a $1,000 reduction in purchase price, uh, on account of what you stole out of there, I said, I'll complete the deal. That afternoon they called up and they agreed to, to give me that thousand dollar reduction. That's when I went from there to the grocery store, restaurant, grocery store. From there to the real estate business, 
I got licensed December 10, 1945, as a real estate agent. And, uh, I'm still in the real estate business. If I'd stayed in business out of government, instead of being tired, I'd been retired, I imagine. <laughs> Uh, so, you stayed in real estate until 47, commercial real estate, or? Well, it was residential and commercial, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Back then, we, we used to sell residential lots, so, you know, on in improved subdivisions for $100 a piece. In fact, we sold state and 14th Street property over there. Those, me and my wife turned down some of those brand new homes built by CNS Bank and, and their uh, co-developer, or 32 and $3,300. Because they won three hundred dollar down payment, and I didn't have that much. And then they were. Uh, I told Virginia, I said, "We'll just wait till it comes down, and then we'll get one of them." <laughs> and they never did. Now they sell for eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> but I, I, I left there after I got out of the, uh, in the real estate business. That's when I had the automobile accident, like the lost family, an unborn child, or oh, that was injured because of it and still carries marks of it and then my first son and uh, I lost so much because of Virginia's illness after the accident and her carrying the baby it didn't look like I was going to be able to get going and I had a piece of property on Hempel Avenue it was an old place they used to dump dirt and rubbish and so forth and uh, I couldn't sell it and I got in rather destitute about it, and I finally was able to, I went to all the banks and couldn't borrow any money. I wanted to build a building on it, and then I thought I could sell it with a building on it. I couldn't borrow it. Finally, I got an uh, insurance man to loan me $12,500, put my building on the property, and then I still couldn't sell it. Money and built the building. Right. I even went to the Small Business Administration to try to get some money. And I went every, every source, all the banks. They all turned me down. And finally, I convinced one man. And I think the reason I convinced him, he saw an opportunity to sell me a lot of insurance. And so I, I got a $12,500 loan started started that building. And I did most of the construction work. I didn't do the masonry work, but I did a lot of the carpentry. Did you build it some as a restaurant? Some of the plumbing, some of the electrical. Were you building it as a restaurant? or? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I designed it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, that's the reason it didn't look so hot. <laughs> <laughs> but I did my own design and a lot of my own construction. In the was it a cafeteria style to be? No, with? sir. No, sir. I had eight booths and uh, ten stools, mm -hmm. and I had drive-in service. And I went from well, there. That was to new, wasn't it? Sir, drive-in business. Y people yes, went sir. out, waited on the cars, or yes, sir. Kind of like the varsity type. Yes, thing? sir. Yes, sir. We used to sell there at that place. We'd serve up. They're like on. Saturday night our special was two pieces of chicken, two vegetables for four to five cents. And uh, we like to, like to not made it. Virginia and I worked the first year, 11,000 hours, $1,700. Plus what we ate out of it. And the IRS got asked us about what we ate out of it. <laughs> Did you have tech students come then? Were they a big Oh, yes, sir. Or? Had we not had tech students and better food than they had at tech, we wouldn't have made it. Because we were on the wrong side of the tracks. The uh, middle and upper class wouldn't dare come to Hempel Avenue over near what they call Bellwood and, and the Tech Flats and the Howell Mill Road yes. area. They, they just, that was the bad side of the tracks. And so we could not get uh, people from other parts of the city. And the people in, that lived in our area didn't eat out. If they did, it was a hot dog occasionally or something like that. They couldn't afford to eat out. So it was it was was not easy. But uh, it was what we wanted, so it worked. Mm -hmm. God blessed us. Gave yeah. us that opportunity. The country and our economic system, you know. It. I understand it expanded several times. That you've been... It was eight or nine times in eight years. <laughs> sure was. Did you oversee the construction of all yes, of that? Yes, sir. Right yes, I never had a general contractor. <laughs> Couldn't afford one. So y'all stayed there and, and prospered and, and expanded. I, the next significant thing I really wanted to ask you about, if there's anything in, in between, 
was in 1954 was the big school desegregation decision. I wonder how that affected your, you personally. Did that spur you to get involved in politics? No, I don't believe so. No, I was in business and doing the best I could with my business. Did you back then? You know, at that time, I think you're talking about the city licenses said that you served either black only or white only. That's right. <laughs> Separate water fountains. I remember that all over 10th Street. That was government's requirements. That's huh? right. That it was wasn't a required by either black or white people or white people, but political did arm you, of government required that you do those things. Did you consider yourself a Republican or a Democrat or during, say, Truman's administration? I think everybody just generally back then grew up in, in this area primarily uh, middle and under class, poor class. Democrat. What did you think of Harry Truman back then? Did you like him? Or? Oh, everybody loved Harry Truman. Because I think the best president we ever had maybe might have been Eisenhower. He didn't start nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you support Eisenhower in 52? When he... uh, I supported him when he ran. Mm -hmm. I forgot what years. I thought it was later than 52. That was his. Yeah, he followed Harry Truman, did right. right. Truman, that's, that's correct. Yes, the sir. first time I ever yes, saw. Yes, I supported him. I first, my daddy had an "I like Ike" button on it. I know he'd always been a Democrat, and I was surprised. Well, what what, what happened? See, he could have uh, been elected as a Democrat or Republican. Right. He was an, an American Idol, a hero, and it wouldn't have made any difference. The Democrats would have liked to have gotten him, mm -hmm. and uh, it would have been the same. He would. It might have been better for the Democrats to have elected him than the Republicans. Maybe the Democrats wouldn't have got so far to the left. Well, Eisenhower didn't start, as far as I know, it didn't start anything new. And if that happened for the next, you know, up through Lyndon Johnson, today we wouldn't have a debt, a national debt. We'd still be a, a stronger industrial power and all. Uh, because it's government programs that, that are bankrupting our nation. We're deep in debt. We're getting deeper. <laughs> well, that, uh, so you weren't really aware, you didn't make any big political turn because of the school desegregation decision that you don't remember that it's having any significant effect on No, sir. Okay. When did you I opposed it like most everybody else. Yeah. Did you feel like Earl Warren was uh, an enemy, so to speak, as people began to talk ugly about him in the South? I heard plenty Not of Not only Earl Warren, but generally a lot of the uh, appointees of the Supreme Court, just like some of your presidents and some of your congressmen, some of your governors that uh, I think uh, some of their political philosophies have been very harmful to this country. And uh, I still see the Supreme Court not following the Constitution, it's just their own uh, political beliefs mm -hmm. that determines what the court decisions are, not the Constitution itself. Well, did you when you first started putting the Pickrick ads in the paper, which is my first recollection of you as a political person? Were those political? Surprised you could even remember those. You're not old enough. I'm 1954. I was eight. I read the newspaper. Well, I started those. Yeah, but I started those in 1948. That's what I was going to ask you. When did you start those? And I didn't think they, you could remember that. No, I was only two then. I, was, I, I couldn't realize two. I remember reading them in the 50s, in all honesty. But I, you, they weren't political when you first started them. But then they became political in the 50s, is that correct? Well, they were. I don't know where they ever really came all political. I, I mean, I commented about Santa Claus, about Christmas, about God, about husbands and wives. Or, they always had some humor huh? in them, I remember. But it seemed like in the 50s, they began to be politics would creep into them. You're talking about. Well, I had a lot of that in there. Mm -hmm. I disgusted, well, you know, with some of the things happening in our own city, like when they built the new monkey house. I figured out it was costing $25,000 per monkey for an apartment. And, and nobody would nobody would even give a $1,000 a month for an apartment for a poor person, for a human being. They thought we thought more of our monkeys than we did our people. And so I told the city hall up for that. In fact, the, every city councilman back then was buying the line of constitution on Friday night to see what I was saying the next day. I never will forget Jesse Draper, one of the top... Uh, Capitalist in our city, one of the top civic leaders. Yeah. He come into my restaurant and asked me, to "Please leave him alone." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, 
Well, I got your first race against uh, William Hartsfield in 1957. How did you come to decide to enter politics against Mayor Hartsfield? Anything particular that spurred you on? The thing, most of all, I, I never had anticipated I'd be a candidate for public office. I always wanted to be part of the private free enterprise system because it's what made our country great, you know, and still it's what made the world better. Even Russia's better off. China's better off. Right. Why? Because of our economic system. They're starting to go in that direction. And we got our own people here, like in some of our Democratic, some of our Republican people, and the Jane Fondas, and, and the Andy Youngs, and, you know, and the, and the Ted Kennedy's are waging war against this economic system. And I think we're losing today, and we're, no one's taking nothing away from us. We're giving it away. We're not defending it. And the business leaders are more guilty and the politicians. You don't expect politicians to lead. You, you shouldn't. If you do, you're stupid. You know, they follow us. They respond from pressure. Right kind of pressure, right kind of government, right kind of, wrong kind of pressure, wrong kind of government. I think it's that simple. But the business leaders are not defending our economic system in this nation. Did they're afraid they'll lose a dollar or a vote or maybe they'll get in a cartoon or get a bad editorial and so forth, you know. But uh, I, 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 I got involved in politics I have to watching people campaign one way or another and live another you know did you feel like Hartsfield was kind of in that mode that you just described of well I know he was against I didn't free feel like it I know it. it was against free enterprise yeah he well not against free enterprise a part of the political establishment that they placed ahead of everything else of saying one thing to the public and behind the doors living another way right huh and Jesus always, you know, the strong, strong statements he always made, and he did it right in their faces, said, you hypocrites, huh, you vipers. And he never, as far as I know, according to the Bible, and, and I've studied it all my life, you know, he never did hesitate about calling somebody right to their face, you hypocrites, or you vipers. Well, we got the world full of them back then, we had them, and we still got it full. It may be fuller now than it was then, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I was just... Uh, it still bothers me to see people act one way and live another. In the recent presidential race, I've talked to state officials, some of the dearest friends I've ever had in my life, and they agreed that they couldn't go along with any of the Democratic nominees, and yet they endorsed one and he lost out, and then they endorsed another and worked for him. So, and they've told me in private, you know, one of them even told me, I said, why don't you fight back? You know it's wrong. And he said, we know it's wrong, he said and says, Governor, you go ahead because you're, you're not in office now and you can talk and when I get out, I'm going to talk. Huh? And that's, ri that's this year. That's and it still that's goes hypocrisy. on. That's real hypocrisy. Well, did you feel like Hartsfield, was, was it a philosophical thing like you just described, Major Run against him, or was Hartsfield up to some particular issues in the city that really... The made crime in our city, and it's, today it's almost out of control, not only in Atlanta, but all over many parts of the country. And uh, the crime situation and the lottery and the gambling and the prostitution and the illegal alcohol things that were going on, they were controlled by our police department. And then they, they can some come come tell me today if they want to that, that I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's because they don't know what they're talking about. So help me God, it's the truth that our Atlanta mayor's office and you couldn't have all these things going on, even Mickey Cohen, wasn't that his name? Yeah, he said, you can't, you can't run a lottery, you can't run this gambling, you can't run this illegal alcohol, you can't run this prostitution. You can't have all these things going on without condonement and approval and the knowledge of your mayor. Huh? And you can't. And so that's the reason uh, Archie Lindsay, he's deceased now, he was my Sunday school teacher in North right. Carolina back in the around 1930. Yeah, they did a primary and you entered after the primary. Right? Yeah, Archie wouldn't campaign. He's like a regular politician. He was my Sunday school teacher. He was my friend. He was a good man. And uh, it, But he wouldn't campaign on the issues. None whatsoever. He came within 3,000 votes of being elected mayor of Atlanta. But the crime situation and the law enforcement and the mayor's office being knowledgeable of it and protecting it and condoning it. He wasn't there open. That's why I got in a race. I was I even had a fundraiser in my restaurant for Archie Lynch and he wouldn't even campaign. Just like, you know, most politicians how they get along, they go along. 
So as after the primary, how did you get onto the ballot then? Did you have to raise signatures to get on the ballot? I had to get signatures. How'd you go? And they laughed about it. Hartsfield laughed. He said, "Well, he said they say he won't even get 2,500 votes." And they took a poll and found out I was leading it. Didn't have but eight wards, and I was leading in six of them. There's, Isn't that something? There's evidence that you got that you actually carried the white vote in the 57 race. Oh yes, sir. That you actually got a majority. Yeah, I did that in the last governor's race. Mm, 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 mm. What's about the uh, Atlanta Civic Improvement Association? What the heck was that? Were you involved with them? I don't know, but you know Hartsfield and his crowd, when they found out that I was leading, he had never set up a campaign headquarters in the city of Atlanta before. And he opened one the next day. <laughs> and uh, Bob McDougall and them raising 25000 that night when Ross and Sosis brought in that poll, showed I was leading six of eight wards. They raised him 25000 that night and 25000 the next night. And Ross told me later on, says, if you, did you know that? I said, sure, I guessed it because you wouldn't have opened that office and raised all that money that I was leading. He said, well, you ought to took advantage of it. I said, well, I didn't have no money. <laughs> I didn't even have a secretary. <laughs> and almost got elected mayor of Atlanta. If I hadn't taken that poll, I would have been elected. What about the Fifth Ward? He used to call it the Bloody Fifth Ward. Was, where was that? And were you... I know where the fifth ward was, but I didn't know it was bloody. <laughs> was I don't in, understand it that. My, it was in my notes. I didn't. Know. I was wondering if it was something that y'all really contested closely or something was kind no, of sir. Up grabs, so. I, no, sir. I didn't know any difference between, between the wards. <laughs> I know the rich people were from fifth ward, eighth ward, Buckhead area, and so forth okay. like that. I believe eighth ward was in Buckhead. Maybe the seventh ward, maybe something like that was in West End, and so forth. Fifth ward around like uh, Grady High, Oak Keep, right. I, I believe. How many signatures did you have to get to get on the I ballot? I don't recall. Did you, did but you I got enough. You got enough to, to get on there. Yeah, and I had them delivered over City Hall by uh, Brinks and Company. To <laughs> make <laughs> Yeah, they were they were a hot commodity. <laughs> Uh, I bet they were. Well, that was, this was your first campaign. Did you enjoy campaigning? Looks, you seem like somebody who's always enjoyed campaigning to me. Though, as I've watched well, if you're it. on a mission or you're on a crusade, how else could you do it? Some guys just look like they don't uh, belong there and don't like it. It's, it's just like recently. I've traveled in 102 Georgia counties in South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and Florida, mm -hmm. and some 300 cities. I started out, I was going to see if I could help Mr. Dukak to get beat. And it wasn't, but 24 hours later, I found out he'd already done it on his own, <laughs> you know? So my, my campaign really, 8,400 miles in seven weeks in six states was to try to get my Democratic friends in Georgia to get off of Dukakis and my Democratic elected officials in the other five states to get off of Dukakis. Because so long as the national leadership knows that we, they got us sold in anyhow, regardless, they keep moving to the left. The only way to bring them back to the mainstream is to refuse to go along with them. Because they know we're hooked anyhow. It goes wilder, wilder, and wilder. Well, it looks like you were pretty successful. Huh? Well, I don't know. I didn't get them off of him. I got a lot of them to shut up. Huh? <laughs> and that was worth a whole lot just to get them to shut up. So that when, was pretty much your intention. To when they it. tell me, say, well, you're out of office. You can talk now. When we get out, I'm going to talk one of them to them. And he's as big as you can get him. Well, it makes me, it's like the businessman, one of the top industrials in this country, the big regional meeting. He, years ago, he put his arm around my shoulder, shook my hand, told me how much he appreciated it, said, well, we really appreciate you 100%. We're for you. We want to do all we can to help you. We appreciate where you say, where you stand, what you plead. And I said, that man, that sounds great. And you know what he told me? He says, yes, Governor, but keep it quiet. You know we're in business. That's what politicians say all day, every day. That's what's irritated uh, you, and that's that kind of attitude has motivated oh. you politically all your life. Oh, disgusting! You know that job over at the governor's office didn't pay for fourteen thousand dollars a year. When I got elected, I would have taken it for nothing, just to get over there. And one thing to do what I could for my state. The other thing to prove to everybody that said the world was going to come to an end if I got elected that they were wrong. And the others find out that everybody that went in public office had to change. 
it's been said that you're one of the few people in American political history that didn't benefit financially from your political office. No, I had a lot of opportunities. But, that it actually hurt you financially. To oh, yes, sir. But that's all right. Sacrificed financially. Right. Did you? Look at the people who gave their lives in the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Their fortunes, mm -hmm. their businesses, they their lands. They stood to hang. Huh? They stood to hang if they lost. And they knew it. They stood up there in, in Philadelphia and said it. You know? Well, Hancock got up there and said something. Better not sign this thing. He said, may get us in trouble. We may lose our fortunes and so forth. And most of them nodded in agreement. We better not. You know, that's you generally somebody get up and say something, everybody goes along with the A or nay or something like that. Like your board of directors in business, somebody gets somebody say, everybody say, hey, hey, yeah. hey. You know, so they got one leader. So he said, we better not sign it, may get in trouble. And that's just like today, better not, may lose a customer, may lose an election, may lose a vote, you know, mm -hmm. may lose a dollar, may lose a business, may lose a job. Yeah. And say, well, well, we don't then, we just get along by going along. Mm -hmm. And so, in the face of all that though, John Adams got to the floor and said, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, I give my hand and my vote to this document. It may cost treasure, it may cost blood, but generations for the day, people are standing around this country with bright illuminations in the sky and tears on their cheeks, they thank God we did sign it. That's what John Adams said. Hey. And then John Hancock's, the fellas try and talk them all out of it. Most of them had agreed. He said, let me sign it first. <laughs> he grabbed it, signed it at the top, great big plane so the king could see his name, this old John Hancock. Huh? Hang together, we'll all hang separately. And, the, and this goes on every day, right now. Mm -hmm. And they think at the Capitol, they run in state government. And they think in Washington, they're Democrats and Republicans running, and it's the media running the country, and the politicians are following. It sure seems like they dictate the, dictate the tune there. Uh, okay. I know I got you all. No, no, that's, that's, this is genuine spontaneity here. <laughs> that's what, what we want. I was just wondering how you felt after the race, or, or how you, you, see, you enjoyed campaigning against Hartsfield, did you think you had a real chance to win? Well, the fact that I, I had won in six out of eight wards, and the victory was mine, and they had laughed about my candidacy and wouldn't open the campaign headquarters, and it never opened the campaign headquarters, and they took a poll and found out I was leading in those six of those eight wards, and they raised $50,000 within 48 hours, and opened the campaign headquarters, shows that I was winning. And I did have a change, or I wouldn't have been involved, because my business was too important, the thing that I love most. But after I see people, like I told you earlier, campaign one way and live another, mm -hmm. it bothers me. And the people know little about what's going on in their government. Well, did little, you, very little. After Hartsfield got elected, did you continue to work against him? Did you preach against him in your ads? And I don't recall. I, I kept involved with local and national things and so forth. Did you determine to stay? I know your next race was against uh, Ivan Allen in 1961 for mayor. Did you determine to stay in politics after you ran against Hartsfield or did Allen just make you so mad you wanted to run against him too? I don't think it was so much Allen. See, first it was Archie Lindsay not really campaigning. And the thing is that the very basic thing that had bothered me of my life and still does, that people campaign one way or live another caused me to do this. Mm -hmm. It's it hard to get the truth to the people. Mm -hmm. And I felt that Lester Maddox always had an opportunity. We all had an opportunity, but the others wouldn't take the change or wouldn't exercise that opportunity. But we go along with the crowd. And it still happens. Every campaign going along with the crowd, the best evidence is we can't support any Democratic nominees. We'll not because they're all too liberal or too leftist. And then the same person or the same people come along and endorse one that they said they couldn't. And then when he falls out to go endorse another one that they said under no circumstances could they ever support. 
See, it goes on and on and on. And I know I'm an outsider, and that doesn't bother me. I'd whole lot rather be an outsider and say what I believe and live as I believe and stand as I please than to be an insider and not be free. There's no, I don't believe there's any top elected official that I know of that exercises the freedom that he has as an American in public office. That's Democrats and Republicans. A real lack of candor among politicians. There's no question about that. I think that's one of the things that's always distinguished. And business people too. Mm -hmm. But more than that, the media, huh? But did you see any difference between Hartsfield and Allen? Was one particular? Did you were both of them equally hypocritical in your? Well, they both both belonged to the establishment and could not represent open, honest, efficient government of, for, and by the people. And we've been told all our lives it's supposed to be government of, for, and by the people. And it hadn't gotten to that yet. Mm -hmm. It's of, for, and by whoever gets elected. So your real differences with Hartsfield and Allen were basically philosophical, not really hard issues in the city that you differed uh, with them on, that you hard issues, campaigned on? The hard issues about the criminal growth that's condoned and approved and known of by politicians you mean specifically like and tolerance of prostitution and whiskey and gambling in Atlanta that they knew yeah, about? Yeah, because all of that leads to other crime. Right. See, well, I had witnessed our Atlanta Police Department officials, the top chief involved, not knowledgeable of things going on, and uh, detectives and police officers in the lottery headquarters. And all of them meeting with in my restaurant and the chief of police whose men had been involved in a, a lottery cover-up because the lottery king had him in his office and in his shop every day I was there in the neighborhood in Salt. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he was uh, being tried and his men and a lot of them were my dear friends for their involvement in the lottery and the foreman of the federal grand jury was the chief's number one friend even with a line of police radio in his car mm -hmm. and they're meeting lunch in the pick rick restaurant mm -hmm. the so. chief of police and other police officials and the foreman of the federal grand jury trying the line of police department having lunch in my restaurant regularly mm -hmm. and those kind of things. So there weren't really any racial issues that you had difference with is about Hartsfield. I really don't believe race was Wasn't part of it. At, at that point. Now with Ivan I was accused of it, you know. Well I think Allen's generally perceived as being more liberal than Hartsfield actually. I I thought that he uh, might have Well he's a fraud though. Ivan Allen, the uh, businessman here here in Atlanta. He was more or less a racial liberal, was he, compared, no, sir. Com compared to no, Hartsfield, sir. was he? No, his beginning was, uh, if you haven't found it out yet, his beginning was he wanted to be governor. Are you aware of that? He's no kin to me now. I know, but are you aware? <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. No, sir, I just knew it don't matter whether well, your daddy or your brother. It don't I, have to know my brother. You know, it doesn't, in the, in or my office, dad. In the office products business that got into politics and tried to give Atlanta a more liberal image, so to speak. No, but what about it? What about before he started for the city of Atlanta? What have you got on that? I don't, uh, he had gubernatorial aspirations before he ran for mayor. I don't know anything. About yes, sir. And when Marvin Griffin was governor, yes, sir. he tried to get Marvin Griffin to call a special session of the General Assembly to preserve the county unit system and segregated schools. That's not liberal. <laughs> huh? That's not very liberal. Well, he was the most outspoken person and non-state official in Georgia to preserve the county unit system and segregated schools. Being in Atlanta. I've, Ivan Allen. He wanted to be governor. And that's right. Well, called me the campaign. People, you know, 
see, see the difference between when he wanted to be governor and when he wanted to be mayor? Right. It was like two different human beings. And that's generally true of politicians mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sometimes ministers and preachers and business people. Mm -hmm. Ivan Allen says, and it was all over the newspaper, Governor Griffin, we've got to preserve our segregated schools. You ought to call a special session of General Assembly to pass whatever legislation we need. And we've got to preserve the county unit system. And you ought to call a special session of General Assembly. Then he found out he couldn't be governor of Georgia. Then he swapped to what you're talking about now. Okay. A lot of people don't know. I don't know when he was a fraud. <laughs> when he wanted to be governor or when he got elected mayor. Huh? He didn't change his convictions. Right. One of them's true. Even while he was mayor or when he wanted to be governor. Right. And I don't know which is the truth. George Wallace is the same way. And I ain't never had a better friend in high public office than George Wallace. In fact, I, I'm the only governor in the United States. Let him have a presidential campaign rally on the Capitol grounds, you know. Mm -hmm. But he's, he joined the very crowd after his tragic injury mm -hmm. that I may have been partly responsible for. He joined the, he joined the crowd that he said was destroying this country and became a, a leading part of it. How do you figure you'd be partly responsible for his being shot? Well, he was, you know, uh, running as an independent. And he, he got unfavorable media and very little media. And uh, he couldn't get anywhere. So I had my plane landed in Montgomery one day and had him and his wife to meet me at the airport. And uh, I told him, I said, if you keep running as an independent, you'll just keep making some news and that's it. You'll never get anywhere. But if you'll pull out of the, as an independent and become a Democrat, I said, Governor, I said, you'll take North Carolina and Florida and they'll launch you. You'll get more media in a week than you get a year as an independent. And first thing you know, you could be on the road to the White House. Well, he wouldn't agree with me that day, and as in August. But he was giving it a lot of thought. He and his wife on the back seat, and I was up in the front seat of his car. He announced in December he would run as a Democrat instead of an independent. Sure did become. And he began to sweep the country. And the media got behind it with the coverage, even though they didn't, couldn't go with him or something like that. It was so profound and so noticeable that it couldn't be covered up. And then he was shot. And his wife told me in Virginia in the hospital room in Silver Springs. She said, Governor said, I want to thank you for talking Georgia into changing from an independent to a Democrat. Did you fly up to Maryland after he was shot to see him, or were you with I didn't ever see him while I was in the hospital. I understand. His condition at that moment when I was there what didn't permit us to go in. Yes. But his wife told, you. told us there in the hallway. said, I want to thank you. She, Virginia was there. said, I want to thank you for talking George into running as a Democrat. Was that Lurleen Wallace, I guess? No, the other one, the black headed the tall one. The... I'll be dead good. Best and so he never would have gotten, you know, he never would have uh, gotten that prominent. And maybe it's a Hinckley, is that his name? No, that was the one that got raised. Brimmer. Yeah. Brimmer, I believe, is the one. Arthur yeah. Brimmer is the one yeah. who shot him at the shopping center. If George hadn't have gotten to be practically number one at that time in the campaign, he may have never been shot. And if he stayed as an independent, maybe he would have never been a shot. I'll have no way of knowing, so I can't take any guilt for it. Mm -hmm. But I'll always wonder in my mind that if I had left him alone and he hadn't changed from independent to a Democrat, certainly he wouldn't have gained the notoriety, the publicity, and the prominence. And he may have not attracted an assassin's bullet. He was winning primaries up north as a Democrat, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yes, sir. Well, he was to... shot in where Baltimore or somewhere else? Uh, something Springs. Several Springs, then something. maybe that's it was what... in a shopping I... center in Maryland somewhere. I, I can't remember in the, in the suburbs. Well, 
And but I swapped him over in here. And then he swapped completely over just like Ivan Allen. Yeah. Totally. Totally. He was, uh, got so a lot of butts. When was, when was he true? I see your point. I see your point. Well, did you... Well, did you change anything in your campaign when you ran against Allen from when you ran against Hartsfield? Did you learn anything, do anything different that time? Or? No, I was just campaigning for my convictions. Right. Somebody you? outside, you know. I, I was just still tired of watching people campaign one way and live another. Well, you've always been known as a champion of the little man. How did you manage to finance those campaigns, 57, 61, against the, without... How did you finance them? Well, out of my pocket, I guess. <laughs> I don't recall. You know, I probably didn't raise a thousand dollars running for mayor. But I mean, like, you know, I don't believe I raised. You know, I may have raised two thousand dollars running against Mayor Hartsfield. He raised twenty fifty thousand dollars in two nights. That's what you were saying. Right. Like Hartsfield and Allen, they raised money in the Atlanta big business people like oh, Coca Cola yes, sir. and yes, people sir. like that. Well, Mills Lane was the head man for Ivan. Did you ever approach any of the corporate people in Atlanta for Oh no sir. You never no asked sir. Them. Or no politicians. I'd been wasting my time. Huh? And even when I got in the campaign for Lieutenant Governor, you know, I go around and people tell me that even in Trutland County where Jim Gillis was, his governor said, You go over and get that courthouse or you'll get the whole county. I said, Man, I ain't going to them courthouses. I said, I've been in some of them before, and when they see me coming, they make out like they're working. And, and <laughs> duck their head down, you know, like they're working. I said, I'm going to work the people, let them work the courthouse. Did you feel like your campaign suffered because you didn't have enough money to really get your message across? If you'd have been better financed, maybe you could have beat Hartsfield or Allen? Oh, I think I could have. But mine wasn't a political campaign, as they know. Mine was a a conviction, a belief, mm -hmm. a crusade, mm -hmm. huh? a mission, mm -hmm. nothing else. Mm -hmm. It still isn't. Mm -hmm. If you just want to be another politician, you make it a professional thing. And I think that's what's wrong with government, professional politicians. They belong to the establishment. Mm -hmm. They get along by... Well, when along. you ran against Allen in the second campaign, was it pretty much the same philosophical difference with it any was the establishment in charge there were no particular things he was what about the stadium and some of the things that Allen did did you oppose him on any of those no, I wouldn't oppose that. No, not to that no he belonged a tool of the silk stocking crowd in he, fact he was president of the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce so in fact uh, uh, at a Campton Road political rally one night uh, you know, everybody knew that Mills Lane was, Ivan belonged to Mills Lane. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the political establishment. And I was outside the political establishment. And so I called him the silk, silk stocking candidate. I got in that race because one of the other candidates uh, had told me certain things in my restaurant that wouldn't back him up later, who was also a candidate. And it was to expose some of the things that I'd seen primarily, whether I won or not. I think people ought to know some of these things, and so that's why I got in the race. And so I, they, I called Ivan Allen the silk stocking can, and I got a pair of my wife's new hose, and she didn't have many. <laughs> One night, and I pulled them out out of Counter Road, and I said, you're the silk stocking can, and I said, here's your brand new pair. I said, you take them with you. And he took them, you know. <laughs> and another night, he, uh, he got after me at another campaign, Ivan Allen did, about says, Mr. Maddox says, when you get to be, uh, when this campaign's over, you can go back to your pick Rick restaurant or you're going to have some uh, uh, good fried chicken to go along with them good hot dogs you got out there. I said, well, when I got up to answer him, I said, I'm not surprised to hear you talk about how good those hot dogs are because they are great. But I said, I'm not even surprised to hear you talk, start uh, talking about chicken. Because as many eggs you've been laying around town, about the time you start cackling, <laughs> and that shut him up. <laughs> Did you? Uh, what about Muggsy Smith and Charlie Brown? Did you know them? Were they big Ivan Allen supporters, or did they help you? Or they were all part of the establishment to a certain extent, but um, I never will forget. I, I was after all of them, you know, about making them come out in the open and so forth. The only 
the real fellow I thought in that was a, a real, a real, a great person was Jim Aldridge. He's deceased now. He was yeah, the county I commissioner. Him, I got him here on my list. Tell me about him. Uh, he was just a fine human being, and I never, he was the only one I never did get after my opponents. But uh, Charlie Brown, and he's a dear friend of mine now, but, and he'd been in and out of my restaurant a long time, and in fact, some of them tried to get me to run for Georgia State Senate mm -hmm. uh, back in the 50s, and Mr. Shoecraft, who used to be at Lang Steel Company, one of the superintendents they had come to me and said, we'd like for you to run, said, I want you to run. And said, some of the people said, don't, they don't, uh, some of them don't want to go along with it, but I told him, I said, uh, uh, well, Lester Maddox has got a lot of good things about him. He's not all bad. I said, well, I appreciate that, Mr. Shoecraft, because I've told the same thing about you, that you're not all bad. No? And, and, but I told him I didn't want to, want to run, for the, run for the Senate, but uh, uh, Charlie had said some things in my restaurant that he, that he denied in the campaign. And so uh, one night he, he told something, that, according to the journal, he told somebody that I was a liar. And it was in the Sunday morning paper, but I didn't know it. I was getting up ready to go to Sunday school, and Charlie called me up. And said, Lester says, I want to tell you, he says, they got on the front page about that, me calling you a liar and said, I didn't do it. I wanted you to know it. I said, well, I don't believe they'd print it like that if you hadn't said it, would you? I said, but that don't bother me. And Charlie, I said, you, uh, you go ahead and get your tranquilizer and get back in bed because you had probably after, after seeing this, you ain't going to sleep no more and you're going to need something to quiet your nerves. And I said, get ready because it's going to get real bad by tomorrow night. <laughs> I just told him that instead of getting mad at him, you know, you get him a tranquilizer and get him some sleep. It didn't bother me what he said. And uh, so then and it was that in Muggsy. Oh, what a wonderful human being Muggsy was. But he'd gotten involved over at State Capitol. Did he as, eat in your restaurant with <coughs> your personal friends? Um, not as close as some of the others. Uh, uh, Muggsy was a, just a real sweet, fine human being. But he got, <clears throat> got so close to Hartsville and uh, so close to Chief Jenkins and he was a representative at the House of Representatives. Uh, a newspaper article came back then about a bill that he had signed, been signed by co-sponsors and so forth and, and got it all set up and ready to go. And after he got it signed, he changed one page in it to <laughs> and without there signatures of uh, people having signed it, knowing that he's going to change the page, according to the newspaper. And, uh, and then another time, I, I, there's articles about him riding around the police car in Atlanta so much because he was a relationship with the mayor and the chief was such a, uh, I guess he could even go shopping in one of them, you know. So during the campaign, Muggs out, I got me a pair of handcuffs from the 10 cent store. And uh, we were at Bass High School all the time, and the political right out there, candidates for me. And, and I got up and told him, I said, next time you got to urge change on those legislative bills in General Assembly, and, uh, and you can't resist it. I said, you take these handcuffs and lash yourself to the table. <laughs> and Muggsy got almost as wide as that paper. And, I, and so I, then I, <clears throat> then I pulled out a badge. Like you buy in Tinsel store, yes. police badge, sheriff badge, something. And I said, if you're going to ride around the city police cars all the time, you ought to wear a badge. And I gave him that badge. He's already been sick. He's already gone back to the seat when I called him the second time to give him the badge. Well, I guess. Uh, he was, he was a, he died with Alzheimer's last year. Oh, wonderful guy. God, he had a real good uh, sense of humor. So Herbert Jenkins and you were not exactly close buddies either. We were, I started telling on him. I had letters from him about how good our food was, and had the best coconut pie in the world, and so forth. What was but see, when I, when I was put on the grand jury in Fulton County in 1964, uh, I was out of the room when the members of the grand jury assembled. When I came back, I was foreman, and I tr tried to get out of it. I said, a lot of you people, you know, they had them there to represent the Every grand jury back then had some representatives of the establishment on it. I don't care how you draw those names. They were... <laughs> Somehow they were, managed to uh, get on there, didn't uh, they? Yeah, that's the way the jury, they picked the jury. They didn't mind getting an outsider every now and then, uh -huh. you know. Were there any real 
black people or poor people on there, or was it all pretty much establishment people? There wasn't any black people on the one I was on. No. Mm -hmm. And uh, they elected me foreman, and I talked them out of it, tried to talk them out of it, and I said, look, I said, that, that's not right. Do that while I'm out. And I said, well, are you better qualified? And, and uh, I said, if I'm elected, I said, it may create a problem, because I said, if I find some things, I'm going to blow them up and so forth. Maybe some of you would want to. Well, they insisted I stay on there anyhow. Some of them still call me Mr. Foreman. That's 1964. That's 20 years ago. Did y'all investigate so, Herbert Jenkins? Or? Well, you know, I that made me foreman. I didn't want to be. And uh, some of them on there wouldn't go out with me. I got to going out around midnight, or one, two o'clock in the morning. And I found out if we if called down to the sheriff's office and tell them where we was going. Where we're going to be cleaned up time we got there. What we all supposed or if we to we call the chief police office, City of Atlanta Police Department, and tell we want some police to go so and so we're going. When we got there everything was cleaned up. It's just like with state government when I had some of these places raided out in the state. Like you call it George Bureau investigation. The time you got down there sometime, it's already cleaned up. Uh -huh. And so you know you had leaks in your city hall, in your mayor's office, in your state law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, and so uh, I, I quit telling them where I was going and quit calling Atlanta Police Department. And some of these people that in the establishment end of it, they didn't want to go with me, but after some of the things were exposed, there wasn't nobody on that jury that but what they wanted to go out three or four o'clock in the morning, old Lester, you know. <laughs> and I wouldn't tell the sheriff where we're going, and we went in places like on West Peace Street, Street and, and uh, start going there, and the deputy sheriff said, wait, wait a minute, Mr. Maddox. I think they called me Pick Rick back then or something. I said, we better not go in there. So we'll get some reinforcement. I said, what's the matter? I said, wouldn't dare go in there with just two of us. And so we went in black places, white places, wherever we thought maybe, that I thought. And I took a poll from the Atlanta Police Department of what they would do to improve the department, where we had crime that ought to be uncovered in exposed and uh, wage a war against and promised them if they'd give me the information I wouldn't give their name and you'd be surprised we pulled about 700 policemen uh, about all the illegal activities going on in the city that had police protection in the city of Atlanta and it still does what was it mainly gambling or illegal whiskey or prostitution or all of those things well it was stabbings Knifings, well, like a, uh, I, I gave a boy, I don't know, twenty dollars or something like that, a hundred, I forget what it was, and uh, members of the jury knew I was going to do it. And to go out in any place you can buy liquor on Sunday, it was against the law. I said, write down how much you bought, don't buy over a pint anyway, so you can go to as many places you can with this hundred dollars. I think it was a hundred. And uh, where you bought it, who you bought it from, what time of day you bought it, and how much you paid for it. So uh, he spent my whole hundred dollars and uh, brought it in, had it all tagged up. I had it in the secretary's office, Grand Jury, Fort County Courthouse. And then uh, I went in a lot of spots like the old Royal Peacock on right. on uh, Auburn Avenue and so forth. Well, how, how many and I found a police official down there standing in the front of the place where on Sunday night when church was going over they selling liquor by the bottle and a police official one of their lieutenants huh standing there at the gate where they go in and out of the curtain with liquor and him on duty huh? so I had that I called old Ivan Allen couldn't get him and uh, called Herbert Jenkins couldn't get him they finally sent a, a major down there and I made him clear out all that liquor on Auburn. <laughs> and I thought I really accomplished something. They got him over to the jailhouse and let him sign his name and come right on back. <laughs> and I think they finally gave him the liquor back. Oh, no. <laughs> and the police officials protecting him. And all that stuff is going on in anybody's city is, is, a, is condoned and sometimes approved. And sometimes it's always condoned and it's always known. And so when I got on the grand jury and got all those things down, first thing you know, everybody wanted to go out at night, see what was going on. 
And Ivan Alley wanted to come over to the grand jury and make a report. And I knew what he wanted to talk about, the Henry Grady Monument, you know, or, or the airport. And so I wasn't ready for it. So his secretary keep calling and informed me that in the grand jury room that Mayor Allen would like to come. And I said, well, when we get in shape, we'll bring him over. And we didn't bring Herbert Jenkins any of the city alderman in until, until we went, went around. And we were going by what the police officers on the beat had been telling us. In fact, uh, two policemen were seen talking to me down on Lucky Street. They were both transferred. <laughs> Herbert Jenkins transferred the next day. <laughs> this is the grand jury in 1964. Yes, sir. Did, were y'all supposed to study just crime, or did you have any particular mandate? Well, it was, uh, you know, administrative or whatever it might whatever be in the find. prisons or in the purchasing or anything that we found for the bit business of county government. Let me get... And that involved the cities in the place, so I I wouldn't let them come in. And finally, I let them come in, and, uh, and some of them, my friend Jack Summers, he's bad case of Alzheimer's right now. And he said, well, we didn't know things like this was going on. And I found one man that the place is supposed to close at 2 o'clock <coughs> in the morning. And there was a man shot four times, at, three times at 4 o'clock in one of them. And a lot of crime, I mean, stabbings, shootings, murders, robberies going on mm -hmm. in places that were not even supposed to be open and operating. And uh, so, uh, Herbert Jenkins came in there, he got almost as white as that stuff there when I started bringing some of that stuff out of it. And I made the secretary go to the locker and pull out all that liquor I bought in all them illegal places. They said, well, we didn't know that was going on, Mr. Maddox. I said, well, I sure am surprised. I said, they said well, if you just tell us where it's at, I said, we'll do something about it. I said, why don't you just ask your police officers that work for you? They're the ones that told me. Huh? Do you think they were making any money off of it, or they just turned their head to that type of thing because it was too much trouble to fool with, or were well, they actually getting kicked No, out? they wasn't turning their head. There was some money coming back somehow. You're doggone right, and it still does. Yeah. Yeah. we got a morally, this country's on the rocks. Not just Atlanta. Atlanta may be as good as the rest of them. <laughs> Let me uh, get... Really not, uh, not, uh, you know, I think it's positive to look at the negative things. A lot of people think it's all negative, don't they? Well, you got to have a good diagnosis for you Aren't to make you? a prescription. Uh -uh. Isn't it positive to look at things that are harmful and try to do something with them? You can't solve a problem unless you recognize it. I understand. Well, that I don't, you'd run for mayor in 57 and 61 and had come close. And then in 62, you decided to run for lieutenant governor statewide. What... Uh, what motivated you to, to do that? So, same thing, an outsider. Why a statewide office instead of continuing to run for city of Atlanta or uh, Fulton County Commission or something like that? Well, I hadn't met with success in either mm -hmm. one of those. Mm -hmm. And I thought that uh, someone outsider in the state would be would probably be more effective than an outsider going into the local office. Okay. And it continued to give me an opportunity to identify things in our government mm -hmm. that were hidden by the media mm -hmm. and by politicians. Mm -hmm. I had a, a role that nobody else would feel then or feel now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's tragic. It's disturbing. Mm -hmm. Well, the candidates for lieutenant governor during that time, uh, Culver Kidd, Garlandberg, Peter's at gear. What did you think of those type of guys? Why were you? Why would you have been a better choice than they were? For I was an outsider. Did you, did you, didn't belong did you, to the establishment. Is that what you based your campaign to the state of Georgia on? That you absolutely were different from all of those guys had been in politics. All of them were politicians, part of the establishment, depending upon one another. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when uh, Coach Dooley wanted to run for governor of Georgia. Where did he start going? He went to see the governor, he went to see the mayor of Atlanta, he went to see the politicians. And if you're going to be dependent upon the politicians, how can you be any different from them? Whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or rich or poor, or black or white, or rural or urban. He was placing his hands 
even he got elected governor of Georgia to be influenced and controlled and directed by the political leadership that was already there. Mm -hmm. How can you improve it if you want of them? So in, in 62, it was... Uh, there was, wasn't a maverick in the crowd, if you want to know. I mean, that's as plain right. as I can make it. Was it. A, it was an eight-man race. Right. Right. And so your strategy and tactics there were basically the same as they had been running for governor, to present yourself as an outsider right. in the system who wasn't beholding to anybody who was... Not wanting to get along by going along. An independent. See, I tell them I'm a little Democrat, a little Republican, but most of all, I'm a whole lot independent. Were that were there not a school desegregation issue in '62 campaign, or all of you stood pretty much the same on that issue when you were running for lieutenant governor? I don't recall other than the media staying in the racial issue, and it still does. Uh -huh. It keeps it alive, it uh -huh. keeps it growing, uh -huh. it keeps it a controversy. Uh -huh. uh, it's bred by more by the media than in politicians mm -hmm. of either party. Uh, I don't recall the, the racial thing being a part of it. So it's basically a personal campaign. It's a government of, for, and by the people mm -hmm. instead of of, for, and by the whoever got elected. Did you... In fact, the Democratic Party, in every instance, fought me more than the Republican Party. When I finally ran for governor, the Democratic Party didn't have enough money. They spent it all fighting me to even put on a convention in Macon. I had to get up some of the money to have a Democratic state convention. Did you, did you have any particular strategy in your first state campaign or, or different from what you had? No, sir. No, sir. I mean, thinking, that any, how did you decide where to campaign in the state? Where, where to put your... The majority of well, I didn't have any money, so I just shook hands. Beauty shops, barber shops, restaurants, telephone pole workers, you know, mm -hmm. ditch diggers, so restaurant people, bankers. Well, was uh, there any? I would think that the cost of a statewide campaign would be considerably more than a campaign just for a city office. I can see how you could do it in the city, but it seemed like you would have had some help for a state. All I had to do is print up a few things and. Um, and Get in my car and start driving. Uh -huh. I didn't even know where to drive when I was lieutenant governor. Did you get campaign contributions from any? I might have got a thousand. Body or I might have got a thousand or two dollars when I ran for lieutenant governor. Mostly from individuals, though. There were not any big groups or organizations. Oh no, sir! Not one. No. Not one. <laughs> not one. In the whole state. Not a labor union leader. Not a religious leader, not an educator, not a politician, not a Democrat, not a Republican, not a banker, not an industry, not a news media, not one. Not one city hall, not one courthouse. Well, even in the face of that, though, you started at this point to begin to be more and more successful. You got into the runoff with gear here. So somebody must have been listening out there. Well. It's just like this recent thing that I traveled 102 Georgia counties. Yes. Mine wasn't anything scientific in the way of a poll, mm -hmm. but I did get the people that the poll doesn't get. And I got news releases, and it was blacked out in Atlanta, mm -hmm. where I predicted that the difference wasn't going to be some 10% as the polls indicated and keep, kept suggesting, but it would be closer to 20%. And it was over 19% and less than 20%. And you can't get that kind of poll from telephone. Huh? It's like they said, why don't you travel in an airplane? I said, you can't shake no hands and meet no people in an airplane. Huh? You took your own car and went on the road in 1962. Yes, sir, alone. Your own, buying your own gas. And printing alone. Up your, not even a driver. No, sir. And came in second in a seven-man field, eight-man field. Yes, sir. If I'd had the money, I would have been uh, lieutenant governor that year. You must have scared them good. Yeah. And if I'd had any, if I hadn't hadn't had the media treating me like an animal, uh, they never treated uh, Mickey Cohen that way, or John Dillinger, as bad as they treated like or Hitler. <laughs> Huh? <coughs> or Castro. I was an animal. I was a beast. I was inhuman. 
were there any of those opponents that you ran against that year you considered to be more hypocritical than the others, any more moral or less moral? As you came I wouldn't call them hypocrites much as I would just part of professional politicians, and that's what's wrong with our country. Some of them at the Capitol, they brag about being professional politicians. Uh, I wish they were mavericks. I'd rather see, a, you know, at the city hall or the courthouse or the state house or the White House, somebody not a professional and make a mistake and doesn't know about it, then somebody's a professional and make it and cover it up. What about Governor Harris? Now, he seems a little more like you, if you will, than a lot of those other guys you talked about. Is it, What do you think of him? Is he... Governor Harris is a fine man. He's a Christian man. He's a clean man. He's a successful businessman. But he's a get along by going along politician. Okay. He's a professional politician. Okay.